Ticket, Ambiente, Salud y Acción Comunitaria, and she will explain in a minute, um, which is an EPA-funded transdisciplinary team that will study the health impacts of the U.S. <coughs> Navy operations in Vieques and Ivan Municipality of Puerto Rico. Um, she's also the co-PI of an NSF-funded study that examines the political and moral discourse and mental health implications of relocation decisions among Puerto Ricans in the wake of the Hurricane Maria. And welcome and take it away. Thank you so much. Let me make sure this is not on. Thank you so much. And it's uh, really wonderful to be here. I'm so excited that uh, Dr. Rivera was able to, to get me here. It is my first in-person event since the pandemic started. So I feel like I'm back. Um, so uh, I'm going to really just start to, today telling you a little bit about, about myself and my own research trajectory and then uh, go into the history of the United States Navy in Vieques and generally in Puerto Rico and setting the stage for a discussion on community-based participatory research uh, approaches. Uh, and then I'm just going to go dive right into Vieques Ambiente Salud y Acción Comunitaria, which translates into Vieques Health Action, uh, Vieques Environment, Health, and Community Action. Okay. As you can imagine, it's, it is in Spanish, the majority of the time. <laughs> um, but as Dr. Rivera said, I'm a social epidemiologist. Um, and in the, really the most fundamental way, my work is really trying to understand the role of physical places and social spaces, right? Social context in the um, health, right? How does it impact uh, the health of people of color over the life course? I received my undergrad at the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras, where I majored in psychology with an emphasis on social and community psychology. And then I went on to the University of Michigan School of Public Health to the Department of Health Behavior and Health Education for my MPH and my PhD. And then I stayed on as the Corneli postdoc at the Center for Ethnicity, Culture, and Health. Or a crash. So I was in Ann Arbor for quite some time, uh, way longer than she was. <laughs> and now I conducted studies using secondary data sources for many years, where I really focused on how neighborhood ecologies interact with family dynamics to shape trajectories of mental health and behavior among youth of color, especially Latino, uh, Latinx youth in the United States. But after some uh, really sort of just big administrative changes that happened at UMass Boston, I was transferred into the School for the Environment in 2018, uh, where it's, you know, been a great experience, sort of a, a real growth and getting me into the environmental health field. And now, this also happened in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. And as you guessed it, I'm Puerto Rican. That's where I'm from. Uh, and that really had a huge impact uh, on my research trajectory, right? On the kinds of questions that I wanted to understand and answer, uh, especially things that had to do sort of with displacement and the context of mental health and Puerto Rico and sort of that sort of just kind of led me to pivot uh, quite dramatically in some ways into uh, the environmental justice and environmental racism fields. Uh, now, as I, uh, as Dr. Rivera said, I am the PI or co-PI of three major projects. Um, one of them, you know, I used to do a lot of secondary data stuff. So in this one, we actually use that matter. We, uh, it's a mixed method project. We are, we did already, that's finished, uh, a survey in the greater Boston area among BIPOC communities and really trying to understand their perceptions, their experiences, their opinions about issues related to climate change, uh, you know, policy preparedness, all kinds of stuff that were in that survey. We followed that up with some focus groups that we're doing uh, the data analysis now. And then I'm the co-PI of difficult decisions after Hurricane Maria. She said it was it's much more a study of trying to understand the underlying trauma and mental health issues that came up after such, you know, what Mindy Fuller Love calls a root shock, right? Like this, this huge event that completely changes your emotional ecosystem, um, you know, how you relate to the places in which you grew up, et cetera. But today I'm gonna to talk about Vasak. Um, let me just jump in. 
I must say this is an EPA funded grant and our website is saludparavieques.org. Uh, it is in Spanish because we are really trying to communicate with the community in Vieques. <coughs> But I'm sure you can Google translate it. it does, you, know, you can put that, pull that button. We are going to translate it into English. We were, uh, we not need to do a big update uh, with results now. So that's probably what's going to happen. Uh, so let me go back. How many of you have been to Puerto Rico? <coughs> okay. So Puerto Rico is part of the Caribbean archipelago, right? But in and of itself, it is an archipelago. And it is made up of the main island, uh, Puerto Rico, Vieques, and Culebra to the north. We also have other smaller keys and uninhabited islands, but I'm going to put those aside for today. Now, as you can see here, it says the U.S. Naval Activity Puerto Rico. That was the United States Roosevelt Roads base. It was the largest military base outside of the continental United States. And it was tucked in right in that little corner of Puerto Rico. Uh, one of the reasons why they chose that site is because there were two available islands to do some practice uh, for many, many decades. And, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, in 1941, the United States Congress passed a law called Law 247. And this law really just allowed the United States Navy to expropriate about 70%, seven, no, about 78% of the total land of Vieques, sort of this small island. Um, this, as a result of these like massive, massive really expropriations, the, mass, the vast majority of Viequenses were forcibly relocated to the middle of the island, uh, and which, you know, at the time had very little to no infrastructure. I have to say this was done violently with 24 hours notice, and they would just come and bulldoze your house with whatever was it. So you could grab whatever you could literally grab that day and leave, and you had to leave behind uh, your farm, your cattle, your pigs, you know, whatever. And this is the 1940s, right? There's severe food and security issues that, that still exist in this island. Now, uh, the Navy divided Vieques into really three sections, and then one of them to multiple sections. But they essentially, they took uh, the entire eastern, part, eastern half of the island to do active uh, maneuvering and live impact area. Uh, then the western part of the island was used for munition storage and the like, and so everybody was kind of squeezed into a little strip. Um, now, as you can imagine, the relationship between the United States Navy and the against this has been uh, difficult. To say the least, um, it's you know it's been very complicated because not only did they lose their lands, but this meant that they lost their livelihoods. Right? They lost uh, places for education. There was a mass exodus of people from Vieques to the Big Island to Santa Cruz and Croix, which is very very close by, um, and then to the United States. And right now, there's about 8,300 full-time residents in Vieques. Now, it's a big tourist destination. There's a lot of Americans that keep buying up uh, land and houses and sort of deeply gentrifying the island. Uh, but there's about 83 people, 8,300 people that live there year-round. Now, um, in the 63 years of military use, you can imagine all the kinds of munitions and artillery that they tested. And when I went uh, to meet with the Navy last year, they were like, we used every conventional weapons. We tested them in Vieques for the span of 63 years, to which I'm thinking, and some unconventional ones, because we found some evidence about that. So we'll talk about that later, because I need access so I can't uh, you know, get them too mad at me so, so soon in our relationship. <laughs> and, but uh, a lot of these bombs, first of all, it actually changed the topography of the island, especially of the eastern uh, part of Vieques. And a lot of these bombs, and I'm talking about 100,000 bombs or so, did not detonate. And so there's a lot of unexploded ordinances and land and sea. Some parts of the water surrounding Vegas have been described as a cemetery of bombs. And I've seen the pictures. It's really quite tragic. Now, let me give you a little bit of a sense of the magnitude of the exposure. In 1948, we have the first of many war games. 
who knows what is a war game? Anybody have military? Well, yeah, you, you guys don't count. <laughs> the students, have anybody ever heard that term, a war game? So a war game is when the United States military and all of its branches practices a full-scale invasion of a country. And guess where they would practice it? In Vegas. The first time around, there were about 60 ships, 60 warships. Six, have you seen a Navy ship? These are really, really big ships. There were 60 of them. There were about 350 airplanes flying up above the sky and 50,000 troops of all military branches descending that one week into Vietnam. So we, you know, and this happened over and over and over and over again uh, through the years, every possible military conflict that you can think or remember that the United States was involved in, uh, be it a big war like Vietnam or smaller invasions that they did in Latin America, they were all practiced in Vietnam. So, you know, imagine living there, right? Imagine being like a 10 year old kid in the 1950s when this was all happening around you. Um, now, it, activities really intensified in the mid 1970s. And the reason was that the military base in Culebra, that island up on the north, closed down because of sustained protests from residents. So now you know activism works. Um, but this really then meant that everything that was happening in Culebra now was happening in Vieques. And so we started seeing every from 200 to 280 days of continuous bombing on the island. And I have to always remind people, people live here, right? Imagine living in a situation where you know they're not actually targeting your house, right? But there were a lot of accidents of things blowing up, people getting killed because little kids would touch something shiny on the ground and they would blow. So this is the kind of stressful situation in which people are living. Now in 1998, which was the last full year that they had complete access and control of the island, they dropped 22,000 bombs that year alone. Um, in 1999, I think it was February 1999, they used depleted uranium. Uh, they denied it for a while, but then people found it and so they had to uh, fess up and it meant that they had to done it in May of that year. So we're talking all kinds of really bad toxics uh, that people are uh, exposed to. Now, on April 19 of 1999, which was the anniversary, uh, what, today is April 20th? So yesterday, uh, two off-targets bomb bombs killed a private security guard who was actually in one of the really big buildings in the restricted areas. I'm surprised, you know, how could you not see that? Uh, but they did, they dropped two bombs on the building and killed David Sanes Rodriguez, who was this private security guard. And this really led, this was a match and it ignited a huge wave of activism, both in Vieques, which had already you know, been activists for decades, they could teach classes on that stuff, um, but also of people, Puerto Ricans in the main island, Puerto Ricans in the United States, a whole bunch of celebrities and athletes and politicians, even politicians from the US came down. I mean, this was, we were relentless. I was in college when this happened. Um, and from 1999 to 2001, we actually had a continuous camp on the Eastern beaches, on a lot of the Eastern beaches, because the idea was that not one single bomb more, not one more. Um, and so that's what we did, right? We, people were out in the beach, uh, the fishermen were in their boats going around in circles of the big boats, just trying to kind of make them dizzy, I guess. Um, but ultimately they couldn't bomb, right? They couldn't use uh, the site any longer. Uh, now, in the summer of 2001, George W. Bush, uh, who had just become president, he declared that there were gonna be a cease to all military activities in Vegas after all of these protests, right, uh, in 2003. That led to even more protests, by the way, that did not appease the people of Vegas. So they stayed at the beach. But it was on May 1st of 2003, I remember because I was already at Michigan, uh, that the United States sort of passed over the keys to fish and water, to the Department of the Interior, really fish and wildlife, who declared it a refuge site, uh, a wildlife refuge site. 
And then in 2005, it was declared a super fun site by the EPA. Just giving you a little bit of background. Now, over 60 years of bombing led to significant environmental degradation. And these are just some pictures of the beaches. Uh, that always seems to me like a nuclear bomb that's just sitting outside of Vieques. Um, and that's Juan Vera. He's a submarine uh, archaeologist who sort of took a crew and were, went through all, all the sea and the surrounding waters and documented what was happening underwater. Um, the way that the United States Navy is cleaning up uh, the island of Vieques actually means that they put all the bombs together that they find. It's not a cleanup. Or maybe it's a cleanup, but it's certainly not decontamination. Things are contaminated. They put them all together, and we have to watch out every Tuesday and Thursday at 9.30 in the morning to hear for the siren that the bombs are going to go off. So they basically do open detonation. So it hasn't really stopped uh, since 1941. Now, one of the really big arguments to get the Navy out was the public health argument. What are all of these toxic chemicals that you guys are using that are that we know exist in the artillery and everything that you all are using? How is that affecting the health of the people in Vegas? Right. And so um, some researchers at the University of Puerto Rico led some really interesting studies since way before the Navy left, uh, looking at issues of cancer, neurological uh, disorders, um, you know, birth defects, all kinds of stuff in the island of Vieques, and they actually found much higher rates of all of these, right, compared to the people on the main island. Now, ATSDR in 2013 came and said, there's nothing here, <laughs> not at all. They sort of, the Navy had been saying for years, like, no, we're not contaminating anything. The, the part of the island that we're using is just the live impact area that's far to the east. No one should be there, so there should be no exposure. Having said that, Vegas is eight miles long, and the wind goes from east to west, <laughs> right? So they're definitely moving uh, from where the bombing is happening into the residential zones. ATS, you have their report, which I'm happy to, to share. It's really, really big, but I'm happy to share it. Came and divided their analysis into these six uh, areas. I'm clearly paraphrasing in some of them. Um, but basically, they blamed Vieques for their poor health outcomes. They were saying, well, they eat too much fish. And we're all like, it's an island. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they eat fish. Uh, they smoke, they drink, and they dye their hair. And I'm not kidding. This is actually what was said. Women dye their hair. That's why they have heavy metals in their blood. Like, oh, okay, good to know. Oh, my grace. Um, but essentially, uh, you know, we have to remember ATS, ATSDR reports guide policy, right? Until an ATSDR report says that there's something here, the EPA does not have the power to tell the Navy that they have to clean up and decontaminate. So this is a problem. If they did, however, acknowledge that they didn't actually collect much data of anything. Um, and so essentially it was like, well, we don't know, we don't know, we can't say, we don't have the data for this. Um, they found cadmium on pigeon peas, which is um, gangudas, it's actually a staple of Puerto Rican food. And they were like, all wells are great, except that one, don't go to that one. Um, when we know that the aquifers have been contaminated for a long time and vegans have to actually import all of their water from the main island. They cannot no longer use any groundwater from, um, of their own. Now, on the other hand, you have a whole bunch of independent scientists that are saying, wait a minute, yes, there are very high levels of heavy metals and toxins that have been found in blood, hair, nail samples, uh, of Vegas residents. They've also found it in soil, groundwater, drinking water, house dust, plant life, and aquatic life all over the island. And these are just a, you know, a few examples of some studies. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, they did find higher rates of cancer, neurological disorders, asthma, uh, among other health outcomes compared to the big island of Puerto Rico. Now, Imagine that you're a vegan. And with all of this conflicting information and really after over a century of abuse, vacancies are 
needless to say, incredibly distrustful of certainly the government, especially the government that bombed them, right? But they're also very weary of researchers because they have been researched to death, really. So a lot of people have come to do all kinds of sampling in their homes and in their bodies, but then they sort of disappear and, and nothing has happened in the last 20 years. There's been no real change. There's been no uh, law directing them to do real decontamination efforts. We had to fight, we as begins, we had to fight very hard to get the Navy to listen to the possibility of a closed detonation chamber. They bought one, it turns out it's too small for the bombs that are, were used in Vegas. So it was like, we wasted a million dollars. I'm sure it cost more than a million dollars. And now, where does that leave us, right? How can we find out uh, how the contaminants that were used in the restricted zones got to the residential areas of Vegas? And how can we do this in a way that really addresses the community concerns and decades of mistrust? So uh, after congressional lobby, after really years and years of congressional lobbying by the Vegas and community-based organizations and activists, the United States Congress in 2018 directed the EPA to conduct studies that focus on understanding the potential links between different types of military activities on the island and the health of the population. And they were specifically really, uh, looking for RFAs that looked at uh, the role of toxic substances. So the EPA did a uh, request for uh, proposals, and this is the title. So in the title, they were very specific. You have to use, anybody who submits something to this really needs to be using a community-based participatory research approach. So by show of hands, who has ever heard about community-based participatory research? Okay, um, great. Um, so I'm gonna give uh, a little bit of background for the benefit that, of those that um, have not. But CBPR really is, it's, it's not a method, although there are methods associated with it, but it's really an approach to doing research. Um, it is sort of like a philosophy on how we engage with communities. It, it is an approach to community health and, and health inequities research that is really centered on social justice and equity. It recognizes that health inequities will not disappear until social equity is embedded in all of our social structures and our power hierarchies are sort of reset, if you will. A fundamental aspect of, the, of CDPR is that it is a cooperative process where all partners contribute equally at every stage of the research process. We engage in co-learning, local capacity building, and systems development, and advance local community empowerment through strategic um, programs and initiatives. Now, at the heart of these principles is really a deep commitment to power sharing, which is something that researchers are not you know, gung-ho to do and give up power. But in this case, we really do need to share the power. Um, and we need to translate the research findings into interventions or policy changes that directly benefit those local communities. A, an effective partnership requires the active involvement of a diverse set of players uh, to achieve maximum community participation. And address uh, sort of those uh, power imbalances. Uh, we engage in, you know, we, we're, our goal is to have community ownership of the project. Uh, and so we engage in a lot of like reciprocal co-learning. Uh, you know, we work together to write new proposals and, and things that might achieve change. Now, successful long-term partnerships require two things. One is cultural humility and the other one is cultural safety. And really by this, what we mean is you know, having a, a real awareness of the power imbalances that exist between a research team and community members. And I'm sure some of you are shaking your heads. <laughs> like, yes, we, we've noticed. Um, but yes, I mean, basically what ends up happening in a lot of the community placed work is that researchers come, they have a question, they might engage, you know, it might be community engagement that they engage with some community organizations or some residents, but the residents were not themselves uh, part of defining the problem necessarily. So there is sort of a shift there in paradigm. Um, you know, 
in the case of Vieques, I'm not Vieques, right? I have, I have to always, and this is a constant practice, by the way, you always have to reflect on where you are and your power as it relates to the people in the community. And so in my case, you know, starting off with the fact that they didn't receive the grant, I received the grant, right? Like I'm the one that holds the money and can make those decisions. They, um, you know, I'm, I'm the doctor, right? Like the professor and the doctor, and I have all that and then the entire team, right, has that. And these are, you know, just sort of teachers, nurses, community activists, youth that live in the community, right? And there is a power imbalance. And in the context of the United States where a lot of this work, uh, where I started doing CDPR uh, and training, we have to add the concept there of race, right? What happens? It tends to be that the researchers are white, middle class, or upper middle class folks that are not members of the community, and then we kind of go there and hover over the community and decide. So this is something that we have to consistently be acknowledging and working towards and taking concrete actions to address those power imbalances. Uh, cultural safety refers more to a general awareness of what is the historical context, what is the social and political context, right? What is the economic context of the community? And how do we address, you know, through our project, those uh, contexts and those inequities? Are there questions so far? No? I'll clarify. Great. Um, now, by adopting these two practices as integral to the relationship, uh, successful partnerships engage in what is a mutually beneficial and non-paternalistic relationship um, that successfully addresses the knowledge and skill gaps and the conscious and unconscious biases and attitudes that can undermine collaborative research. Now, in CDPR, it is also vital to start a project or a relationship really thinking about the strengths of a community and not just, don't tell me everything that's wrong in Vieques. I actually want to know what is right in Vieques, right? What can we build from? Um, and for, the, for us, this meant doing a lot of legwork during the proposal development phase and sort of reaching out early when we found out that we were getting the funding um, to really learn from the community what is it that the members felt was necessary, what was interesting, and what needed to be included in our work. And so with that in mind, I have these three points. We have been working uh, to best improve conditions for sustainable development in Vieques, especially when it comes to issues of food autonomy. Uh, we are looking and we're working, we're actually recruiting uh, citizen scientists to ensure that the knowledge of how to do contaminant assessments and remediation in particular stays in the island um, so that this is a much more sort of engaging and sustainable model. Uh, we are also hiring, uh, well, we're also working with youth, right, with educators to get students who are interested in science or environmental issues into the pipeline of uh, higher education, whether in Puerto Rico or uh, with us at our university, where we also have MIT, BU, and others. Um, and we have hired local uh, you know, local folks, local project coordinators, you have actually two field coordinators, interpreters in Vieques, and, you know, when we go, we descend, and there's a lot of money that's, that's sort of injected in the economy. Um, sometimes that means it's, you pay more for the service, but you're making sure that the service is being done by a Vieques, right? Um, and finally, and this really came directly from the community, we created a central depository of information that is within our website. People were um, kind of upset that there was a lot of documents from the government that seemed to be impossible to find. So we got uh, some brilliant graduate students, kind of like you, uh, to do incredible searches. And, you know, there's a lot of like sub teams to this project and each of them were looking for different kinds of information. So we've been able to post up there a lot of like Navy reports and ATSDR reports and the like, but also a lot of, you know, articles and even like books on the history of Vieques, the history of the Navy, the links between contamination and health and, and the like. Okay, so this is going to continue to grow. We're also going to start putting things about mitigation once we have done some uh, additional analysis of what is out there. Now, um, 
my study uses CDPR to ensure that vacancies are represented and involved in sharing knowledge and making decisions on the project. Uh, I, we have three aims. In the first, we use a person-centered approach to examine potential exposure pathways. Uh, and this really means where, you know, the behavior of people in Vegas, where they spend considerable amounts of time in and outside of the island and in the surrounding waters of the island. Our second, uh, we are developing methods by which the community collects information that's pertinent to them and uh, contaminant information that's pertinent to them. Um, and we work together to try to solve those problems. Uh, bless you. <laughs> and finally, we employ technology that uses plants to clean contaminated soil uh, and teach vegans how to use them. Now, this is sort of our um, our model. And just to give you a heads up, I'm going to focus today on phase one, which we hopefully will wrap up this Saturday because I'm going tomorrow to Puerto Rico to have this meeting. Um, but we've also started doing some work on phases two, three, and four, which correspond to each of the aims. Okay. Um, yeah, I might come back to this slide a little bit. So let's start with building a partnership. It's hard. It takes a long time. Uh, it takes a lot of conversations, a lot of trips to Puerto Rico, a lot of Zoom calls to sort of build this partnership. Now, we structured the, uh, the project sort of like a, a three-pronged structure when it comes to the leadership of the project. We have an external advisory board of scientists and technology experts and government agencies are there. Uh, other researchers that are have vast experience doing work in Vieques. They're all part of our advisory board. Uh, we have our scientific team that I'm going to show you in a second. And of course, the Community Academic Steering Committee, which is central. Look here, right in the middle, right? Everything goes back to that Community Academic Steering Committee in terms of decision making for the next phase of the project. Now, I uh, usually this is kind of the slide that you put at the end, but I have to say I am the PI of this project, but this is an incredible team of people that is working together. I am not a toxicologist, right? I, I, I confess I didn't take organic chemistry as a <laughs> Shh, don't tell anybody. Um, but you know, I lead this fantastic team that's made up of you know, Lorna is a sociologist, Rosaling an anthropologist, but we have uh, ecotoxicologist, ocean um, chemical oceanographers, engineers, urban planning. Like this is a big team with a lot of different kinds of people in it. And I'm, I'm honored to be their leader. Um, now, the Community <laughs> Academic Steering Committee is representative of multiple sectors in VA. And I, I have to say it's- Yeah, uh, hi. Oh. Pretty good, how are you? <laughs> oh, that is not me. Laura, can you mute, please? I don't know oh, let's you. see. How are someone text them? <laughs> All right. So um, the Community Academic Steering Committee is really representative of a lot of sectors in Vietnam. And this was actually really important. So when we started out, we did like a map of the who's who and where are they in Vietnam. And there's a lot of cross-pollination. Um, you know, it is a small island. But we were able to get representatives from all of these sectors. Um, and the way that it works is that it, we have 15 members or votes when we have to make decisions and two thirds of them are community members and only one third are uh, academics. Uh, we have a great representation of youth in the committee. And, um, you know, it's sort of been a, a really cool experience so far. Um, now, at every stage, uh, what do they do, right? Like, what is their role? They're a decision-making and governance board above everything else. Um, but in collaboration with the scientific team, the members uh, will be at every stage of data collection process, will identify and prioritize what data to collect. They contribute to data analysis and interpretation. They make procedural and logistic recommendations for remediation activities. Who knows, who knows Vieques better than the farmers of Vieques, right? Like what's going on in the land. Uh, they work with us to disseminate results and to propose solutions, right, on how to improve uh, the conditions in Vegas. We've been very busy. 
through Zoom primarily, but we've been very busy. We've had uh, nine big meetings. Uh, I'm not gonna go through what each of this says, but I just wanted to point out, you see to the left, we started out really trying to understand, okay, so what, what are we doing here? What is our purpose? How are we gonna work together? What are the rules of engagement, right? Um, and we had all kinds of conversations about that. We created some subcommittees that each of them then started working on more specific tasks of like developing the community-based participatory principles of the project itself, of doing community outreach and communication, right? Like so each members of the of the committee then became like leaders of their other subcommittees. Now we had a great visit last summer. I was there for six weeks. Uh, and during that time, we had um, a retreat. I'll show you some pictures. But we had a really great retreat where we finalized those to be PR principles. We laid them out very carefully in an MOU. Um, and then after that, since we did a lot of data collection, meetings since then have been about giving results back to the community, uh, to the members of the steering committee. And because we did some sampling and some fincas, also to the uh, to the fincas themselves. The fincas are farms, by the way. Uh, our next meeting is Saturday. All right, so as I said, six weeks, it was great to be at the beach for six weeks. Wonderful after a year of being locked up in my house because of COVID. Um, but this really gave us an opportunity to really get to know each other. And we met with the mayor and the vice mayor and, and got their support for the project. We uh, did focus groups. We did different kinds of interviews. Uh, then there was one week where just like everybody descended and that was an opportunity to do a lot of sampling. We sampled crabs, we sampled soil and water from the different farms to do preliminary sort of protocol kind of analysis. We had graduate students join us in Vieques during the summer. Um, again, the different teams for different reasons, but they were all able to, to come. Um, and then we also toured those restricted zones and met with the EPA that has a local office, Fish and Wildlife, and the name. It was one of the most bizarre meetings I've ever had. Mm -hmm. Um, now, this is a retreat. So you see uh, Vidas de Gesetzvalen is one of our organization, and they sort of organized a panel with uh, act youth who were activists in the island. Um, and you see some pictures of some of our graduate students going out and doing some sampling. Now, as I said, uh, we conducted focus groups and timeline interviews uh, this last summer. And these activities were really meant to provide insight into which illnesses are of greatest concern in Vieques, where and how residents are exposed to contaminants, and what kinds of contaminants are of greatest interest among the community. Now, everything that we learned during our visit and through our qualitative data collection is, uh, has been analyzed and continues to be analyzed uh, and is being used in all future phases of the project. The timeline interviews, for example, were also meant to give a clearer sense of how residents connected their own lives with specific events that were happening, that happened in Vegas through uh, their lifetime. And so we're, we're using that to develop our life history event calendars, uh, which are very, very detailed kinds of interviews that take a long time. They use them a lot in anthropology and demography, if um, you might be familiar. Now, when we ask people about the geographic clustering of illness specifically, a lot of places sort of came up. There was a lot of conversation, but these were the three places that really uh, stood out when we conducted the analysis. Now, uh, I'm gonna, wait, no, how do I, where's the thing? Okay, never mind. <laughs> this is Destino and Wuhan. These are uh, barrios that are very close to the winds, right, of things coming from east to west. And this is Santa Maria, which is the barriada, and Isabel Segunda, which is kind of like the capital of Vieques. If Vieques were going to have to have a city, Isabel Segunda would be the city, uh, followed by Esperanza to the south, which is also very densely populated. And so people were describing uh, these areas as just Folks being in poor health, and they mentioned cancer a lot of times. Um, now, when we asked about contamination, unsurprisingly, they just they mentioned, generally speaking, the East and the West, uh, since that's 
the land that the Navy had. But they were also very specific and sort of visceral in how they experienced that contamination. So they were talking again in Wuhan, there was like constant dust. That's all which, you know, they keep blowing stuff up. So unsurprisingly, um, they talked about a weird stench in Esperanza and in Isabel II and in Caracas Beach, which is open to the public. They talked about La Chiva Beach being a cemetery of bombs. And I've seen those images, they're really quite creepy. Um, and in the Bio Bay, uh, if anybody here has ever been to Vegas, we have, Puerto Rico has three of the five bioluminescent bays of the world. Vieques is the brightest <laughs> of all of those. Um, and so it's a huge tourist destination, right? If you're into like ecotourism and stuff like that, people go there a lot. Um, but they did find um, sort of old ammunition and bullets sort of entering into this area, which is hard to do. If you know anything about bio bays, it's sort of like closed off to the rest of the room. Um, so we took all of this information, I'm sure this is familiar, <laughs> this is a familiar framework, uh, but we took all of this information and we organized it uh, with the conceptual model of exposure and disease. And basically what is being said, right, through the focus groups and interviews is the, the source is the U.S. Navy. It is their training and it is their cleanup efforts. Um, at the very least, they are throwing out in the air a lot of heavy metals. Um, that change your microenvironments, right? Your air, water, um, and food supply. And how are we getting this? We're ingesting it, right? We're inhaling it, and we are, and it's getting into our skin. There's a lot of people with like skin issues in the Vegas. And how much is the absorbed dose? Well, the question is, how long have you lived in Vegas? <laughs> um, right? What is there's always you know biomagnification and genetics things that we have to as well considered, but the key there was how long have you lived on the island? Um, these things are exacerbated by a very limited healthcare infrastructure. I mean, by limited, I mean, there's no hospitals and there's three doctors that go a few times a week from the main island to Vegas, but they don't live there. Um, there's also, you know, the low nutritional diet, everything has to be imported and that leads to like severe issues of food and water insecurity. Um, the diseases that they've mentioned like 28 diseases, but the ones that were mentioned the most were uh, cancer, asthma, kidney disease, mental health, and thyroid issues. Now, we must ultimately decide on specific illnesses and chemicals that we're going to assess with the community, right? And so we've sorted through incredibly copious amounts of information, um, but we really then sort of decided to make this table to list out everything that we had confirmed is in Vieques, right? Um, and that we can map out because of other people's work where it was found with the diseases that those contaminants might cause. Does anything pop up? Anything like jump at you? <laughs> Cancer. Cancer, right? Cancer and kidney disease. So we did. Now I doubt that, um, you know, unsurprisingly, all of this stuff is linked to cancer. Um, and this is the conversation that we have to have on Saturday with the, with the steering committee, like, let's, let's make that final decision. All of this sort of feeds into the human health and ecological and contaminant assessment. Um, now, for the human health assessment, we had decided or, well, let me rewind. The primary objective of the human health assessment is to identify the place, timing, and duration of exposure to contaminants, ultimately mapping out uh, people's movements in and out of high-risk areas through their life course. Uh, we take a life course epidemiological approach to do this, and we're looking at Vigenses life histories to better understand the biological, environmental, and social factors in early life that might have interacted or accumulated to impact health and disease in later life, right? We are going to use human life event history calendars that I just um, mentioned to create conceptual diagrams and maps that include potential pathways of both ecological and human health exposures. These conceptual diagrams and maps will guide monitoring efforts for hazardous chemicals, both spatially, where and in what media, and historically through uh, sediment core analysis. Okay. 
Now, I know last time when I gave a similar version of this, there were a lot of epidemiology students. Are there a lot of epidemiology students today? No? Okay, toxicology students. All right. So, um, since you're not epi, I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, now, think of cancer, right? This is a population that has 8,300 people. In the worst case scenario, right, in the worst of years, there's like maximum 40 new cases of cancer on the island. Now, for an island of that size, that's a lot. That is a lot of cancer. But statistically, right, in terms of epidemiology, that doesn't give us a lot of power to detect a relationship. So, uh, you know, we have that one challenge that we have to, oh, I'm so sorry. Why is somebody calling me? And it's spam, of course it is. Um, no one will call me. Uh, we also have the issue of the survival, right? The incidence rate and the survival rates. What happens with cancer in particular in Vegas is that if you are diagnosed with cancer you, and you stay in Vegas, the chances of you dying within the first five years is 30% higher than if you are a Puerto Rican on the main island. And this really has to do with healthcare access, right? So oftentimes what happens is that people do like out migration to get care. And so they might move to uh, the home of a family member who lives on the main island, or, you know, ultimately sometimes they might just get a place of their own in order to receive care. And once they change their address, we lose them in the registry and they become part of the registry of a different town. So there's like a warped situation of our, how much incidence of cancer we're seeing on the island. Um, there's also the issue in this, this, you know, this happened for decades, although it stopped like 20 years ago. In Puerto Rico, before everything was privatized, uh, healthcare was very regional. And so there were these large regional hospitals. And so you would get care, right, to the one that was closer to your house. But oftentimes people, if they knew that there was one place that was like really good at caring for X, right, cancer, diabetes, whatever, you would find an address near that place in order to make sure that you were seen at that place. That's a little cheating, if you will. But ultimately, people would move away. That's another reason why we're having, we're going to have to track people down who were in Vieques when they were diagnosed with cancer, but then we have to just figure out where did they go, on the main island or even the United States. Okay. And finally, uh, and this is something I would love to hear your thoughts on, has to do with the degree of exposure. Fundamentally, is there such a thing as a low exposure group in Vegas? It is a small island and people have to move around for work, for school, for church. There's so many churches, I can't even tell you. Um, for, seriously, there's like 100 churches in a town with 8,300. Some of them are just families that congregate in their house. It's not. Um, but really, like, can we differentiate in terms of exposure, right? Can we say, well, these people are very high exposure, whereas these people, beyond just age, right? Yes, of course, the longer you live there, the more exposed you are. Um, but some, those are some of the design um, decisions that we're actually going to talk about on Saturday with the community to make some, some final choices, but also for them to tell us how to find people because it's that, right? It's their neighbors, it's their friends, it's their family um, that we're trying to locate. And um, yes, that's it. Now, um, there is an ecological risk assessment that's uh, also happening. And this is really guided by the uh, activities of the human health assessment, but also uh, from the contaminant assessment and potential hotspots that we are looking to find. And I'm gonna show you that in a minute. But basically, through community engagement, the steering committee has helped to choose species of interest for monitoring um, the organism's responses to contaminants. So sort of these sentinel species are, uh, are, are interest because of a variety of reasons. Um, you know, there's the stuff that you can objectively, everybody in the lab knows how to do. But there's also like, we want to know about animals that are directly in the food chain of veganesis. Uh, now, uh, one of our great doctoral students made this map for me, um, but basically we're sort of identifying where there's elevated organics, where there's elevated metals, 
and sort of creating our sampling design, which we just submitted to Fish and Wildlife to get the permit to go into the restricted lands uh, to sample. This is the doctoral student when she was doing the, the sampling in Puerto Rico. And, you know, we did just logistics, right, protocols, all the stuff that you do at the beginning of a project. Now, uh, through the focus groups and the health uh, assessment, the citizen science monitoring activities, we are gathering extensive data on past and present exposures to environmental contaminants. Uh, then we're going to use GIS to construct a qualitative map of potential exposures. Now, in addition, we will construct conceptual exposure diagrams or flowcharts. To the fact that define the sources of potential contamination and the pathways and routes that bring the hazardous substances in contact with humans and wildlife. Uh, we in, are engaging with the community to make decisions about targeted uh, for targeted analytical and ecological health analysis through public participation in GIS. I think everybody here is familiar with GIS, right? So public participation is basically when we work with the community and make the maps with them and they help us identify uh, you know, whatever it is that we want that map to be. Um, now, rather than basing our assumptions on where uh, contaminants are, we have been working with vacancies and are empowering vacancies to, for them to monitor those contaminants themselves in places and in times that they could consider potentially hazardous. Now, armed with uh, these amply block sensors that some folks at the MIT little device, oh, Little Devices Lab have developed uh, with an app to record and share the data. Uh, we are going to be using, you know what, I'm just gonna show you what it is. Uh, but we're kind of doing that right now. So these are our Ampli block sensor. I love them, they look like Legos. I was so excited when they showed them to me at the lab. Um, but basically, you know, they, they're very small. They ultimately look like litmus paper and we're using color chemistry to look to, you know, we're calibrating the sensors to see is this contaminant there and how much of that contaminant are we seeing? And it is a qualitative assessment and we're following this up with more traditional sampling and suites of analysis. But this is kind of what it looks like. We started uh, the process of uh, prototype sensing for the ampli blocks on lead, nickel, and, and TNT. And you see it's sort of like it changes color. The darker it gets, the more of that contaminant is present. Uh, now, following these citizen science efforts, we will um, use much more traditional methods right, for sampling. Um, and the idea here really is to compare the results that we get from the Ampli blocks to what you know, people generally do. Now, if it works the way that we hope it will work and the Ampli blocks are that good, this is downright revolutionary, right? This means that we can give something that's low cost highly portable to communities that don't have the resources to do this kind of work all the time and they can then monitor the contaminants <laughs> on their own. Uh, and finally, we're engaging in remediation. And, and here, basically, <laughs> and we're actually, the team is literally there right now building these plots. But essentially, we're asking the question, what are the best plants that we can use for phytoremediation? What, based on the pollutants that are on the ground in Vieques and how they might interact, like the soil and the microbes and that whole interaction. Um, and so, Alain Colon Carmona, uh, who is a biologist and, and is the copy eye of this part, um, is there right now. We are uh, using a Arabidopsis thailana and tobacco as the plants that we know how everything works there. But we're going to be testing guinea grass, which is to the far left. Uh, sun, that, oh, that grows in Vegas, that's everywhere. Um, sunflowers, French marigold, and hemp to see how good they are at absorbing the metals in particular in the soil. And so they're there right now. This is what the plots are going to look like. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you next week when I go on Saturday and investigate <laughs> what they actually look like, but this is sort of the plan. And then in the summer, there's also another big trip where we're going to be doing uh, recruitment and training of interviewers. We're going to be working with citizen science on the phytoremediation 
Uh, and then hopefully in the fall, we're going to be starting the contamin like the actual data collection of the human health assessment and the contaminant assessment. Um, you know, I get to send a lot of awesome people down to the Vegas with a dictionary. <laughs> Translate dictionary. Um, now, um, and thinking about my own work in the next five years, I, I, you know, I, I should be so lucky that I get to make my career working in Vieques and working for that community. Um, it is something that my family has been a part of for, a very, for many decades. So I just feel like I'm just following on my dad's footsteps, so to speak. Um, we have uh, submitted and we're finalists, you know, knock on wood, on two uh, EPA uh, grant proposals. One of them, is for a STAR grant, and I'm sure most of the faculty in the room at least know what that is. Um, but here we're also doing something that is much more related to climate change, but within the context of a contaminated community. And we're looking at how all of this is impacting food and water security for children with, for families for children with chronic disease and Vieques. Um, we also have submitted, and this is Dr. Helen Poynton is the PI for this, I'm a co-PI. Uh, but one that we would be looking at air. So what we want to do is have our air monitors up and ready so that on those Tuesday and Thursday mornings, we can capture uh, whatever it is that, you know, the air brings through the ones they do open the tensions. Um, and finally, you know, I'm part of a bunch of other projects uh, that look at issues of just context and health. Uh, we submitted a really big proposal to the NIH that was looking at COVID, but in my case, it's looking at historical practices of redlining um, and <laughs> forms of structural racism on the distribution of COVID uh, in like five different states in the South. We're sort of looking at Jim Crow redlining um, and health disparities, which is my work. <coughs> so I know I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna stop there. <coughs> I have actually a lot of questions. <laughs> Maybe the, you can the, answer some. The first first question: What is the age distribution of the eighty three hundred people that are there? Um, do young <laughs> people stay on the island, or do they leave? Uh, no. So if you want to go to school or anything, you have to leave. There's no option. Sure. Right. Um, the question is how many come back. Uh, and you know, not not a whole, it's, it's becoming an older population. That's true for young people generally because of mass out migration in the last 15 years. So I, I can't tell you that that would be a very different distribution than the main island of Puerto Rico. But there are, you know, sort of, yeah, a lot of older folks. So the right. cancer incidence would be expected high. to be high. Okay. Um, but we have seen a lot of cancer in kids. Well, you've got an odd, odd one. The Ewing, Ewing sarcoma yeah. is an odd cancer for that. Yeah. Um, the island is, you said, is eight miles. <laughs> It's 52 square miles, but if you like, but it's eight miles stretched, it's stretched out. out. It's stretched out. It's okay, um, and it is a super fun site now. <laughs> the restricted zones are super fun. Okay, and are they undergoing active remediation now? No. no. Okay. Um, they, I, they basically told the Navy, "You have to clean up this mess," and what the Navy is doing is just gathering all their bombs and then mating them. I guess the, the last question is kind of a sensitive one, and I don't want it to sound like it is, but are you making this population dependent on you for funding? No. You know, resources coming back in. Well, what, what's the, what do they do? Are they mostly farmers? No, no. I mean, there's a lot of farmers and there's a lot of fishers for sure, but there's teachers and social workers. Well, you only have 8,300 people there. Businesses. That's, that's bigger, that's smaller than most towns. So, you know, is what's the distribution of people and what is the, the distribution of resources, of funding resources? You're talking about bringing a bunch of graduate students down, you know, and that touches on exactly the thing that you started your talk with, and that is the investigator colonialization of a site. So let me, let me go. Yeah, I think there. that's really an important thing. Yeah, no, no absolutely. So uh, a few things. There are a lot of very well-established community-based organizations in Vegas that are part of our steering committee and that on their own, they get funding for all kinds of stuff. 
through different mechanisms, most of which are not researched, right, but they sort of exist that way. We are their partners on some of these projects, and so we also have to put our talents to the table to, you know, know how to write grants and got, kind of get this funding, but we're definitely working with them. So in like this first uh, food and water one, the two community-based organizations wrote the grant with us, um, and they will get some awards, right, and they'll be funded sort of on par with the university. If we get, if we get it, we're finalists. I'm not going to win. Um, but when, so, you know, when it comes to doc, with, to graduate students, I think every graduate student that went was Puerto Rican and was either from the main island, their students at the University of Puerto Rico in the chemistry department, they did the analytics, um, or if they were from UMass Boston, they were like Valerias from, Maya, from Aguadilla, which is a town yeah. on the other right. side, right? So we were not bringing, um, well, some of the researchers are like white Americans who don't speak any Spanish. The students were definitely Puerto Rican and, you know, born and raised there. And cool. so there, there is sort of that, that difference. Um, the other part is that in this particular research team, there is a lot of Puerto Ricans. I'm just one of them, right? There's, it's sort of a big uh, team. And I think that really has to do with our passion, right? We sort of want to do work on our, the communities that we came from. Um, although none of us are vegans, and there is a power dynamic there, that constant practice, right? That constantly going back and recognizing our privilege and sort of making decisions to address that power imbalance um, between, between the community-based organizations and the folks on, you know, on this side. Cool. Thank Does you. Does that answer? Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, you mentioned that most of the island is a super fun site. It's kind of like New Jersey, we have 152 sites or something like that. So you never more than a couple of miles. Or so. Yeah. so do you think, some, I mean, that's a very highly motivated population, highly exposed. Mm -hmm. Do you think some of the approaches that you're using there will be applicable to a place like New Jersey? Um, I mean, overall, I'd, I'd have to look at the communities and see exactly what's going on. But I think that overall, in terms of the framework, it can work. Because the idea here is that you go, humbly to the community and start working with them right not not working for them or not working on them but working with them and i think that if that's your sort of just philosophical approach and how you do your work um that can work anywhere yes if you from the plant is able to take out the heavy metals from the soil how would you yeah, right of the dispose plant. of them. Yeah. We're also we're also looking at that, and it's going to depend on the stress reaction of the plants. Um, we have started having conversations with the EPA about that. We go back and forth on whose responsibility it would be to do that. I mean, like guinea grass is everywhere. We just chose it because it's like clearly everywhere. Um, the thing there is that, for example, and you know this is already happening. Uh, you know how there's places that have stray dogs or stray cats? Vegas has stray horses. Thousands of them. They are just walking around. Um, and they graze on the green grass. And there's a lot of horses that have tumors and stuff. So like we could, if we were going to do an animal model of this, this would be, I don't even have to model it. I can just show you what's going on. Um, so we are trying to you know, have conversations with them about how to how would we dispose of it we're also sort of thinking about well there are some plants that clearly would like emanate it in different ways but some that might not and we're sort of hoping that hemp is one of them uh that would not and we could and you know the french marigold is an ornamental plant so part of it is really trying to see what the stress response is of the plants do you think once your project is done in however many years, you'd be able to ask for like better remediation for remediation yeah, the island? Bring it up. Hoping. Yeah, I'm just like trying to think of like other ways that you could help like the people of that island. And I don't know, I also feel like that the community there is like so different. Because I've visited Vieques before and I've noticed there's way more Americans than like Puerto Ricans like on that island well, in specific areas. Right, so it, that depends on where, if, the, if, you know, if I show you a map of Vegas now, we can have that conversation. I, I didn't bring one uh, with that kind of information. But there are a lot of, especially former servicemen that have descended on Vegas. And uh, after Hurricane Maria, especially so much, so many people left the island and sort of abandoned their homes. And those homes then, 
you know, a lot of them were sold for, there's like crazy number of Airbnbs in Vegas. You will never not find a place to stay in Vegas through an Airbnb because there's so many of them. Um, that's really problematic, right? Because it is a deep form of gentrification of settler colonialism. Uh, you know, we have like crypto bros. We hate them, by the way. Don't do crypto and crypto people. That's just not, not a good idea. Um, but we are, you know, trying to, to see how to best uh, do remediation. Having said that, the bug stops with the Navy. It is their job and responsibility. That is what happens with a Superfund site, right? Like you broke it, you fix it. Um, and it is really a matter of some of these projects and working with ATSDR so that they revise their reports so that we can finally say the EPA is giving you the order, the directive that you have to decontaminate and not just clear it of the bombs. Now, clearly, we don't want bombs because people die when they touch them and they blow up. So that was sort of first line of action. Um, but they have not, to my knowledge, been developing any real remediation or, or remediation or decontamination plan, which is, you know, I think a form of environmental racism that has been going on there for since they started, right? You this kind of stuff doesn't happen in like white middle class or upper middle class neighborhoods, right? This kind of stuff always happens near poor people of color. That's just, you know, poor white people, but people that don't have the resources to fight That's back. True. Sorry? That's not true. I mean, there, there are all kinds of, of terrible constructions around white. My neighbor, where I was raised, coal fire generator. Was it an affluent neighborhood? Moderately, yeah. Really? Certainly middle class. Um, and were they but, able to fight back? Sorry? Were they able to fight back? No. No? God, no. No. Everybody needs jobs. Um, but, you know, I think in this particular case, it's very definite. Yeah. Absolutely definite. I mean, that's why they chose the place to begin yeah. with. Like these poor yeah. brown people, they don't matter. We're just going to take their land and they, they actually in the 1960s a few times they tried to take over the whole island of vegas there's a this thing called operation uh dracula what is it? operation dracula it sounds so creepy but they were they wanted to come and empty out all of the cemeteries in vieques so that vieques wouldn't have any reason to come back to the island uh you know it's a very religious community so you know we go back <laughs> to the cemetery to put flowers and stuff like that um, the Catholic Church had to intervene on that and sort of then the Navy, the Department of Descent said, okay, we're going to stop trying to do this. Um, but the relationship between like service men and, and women um, and the residents of Vegas was very bad. I mean, there was, it was very violent. There were, listen, I, this is the least of it. Like the kind of unspeakable horrors that they imposed on that population. I mean, they would break into people's houses in the middle of the night drunk and rape everyone in the house, men, women, children, right? And I have heard so many stories of that kind of, um, they would get into fights uh, outside of bars and they would, um, you know, ended up killing a few against us. Now, they, they gave as good as they get. I think that a few servicemen were also killed in fights like that, which is, you know, tragic either way. Um, but now to, to sort of your earlier question, there are a lot of Americans. They're sort of clustered in specific spots in Vegas, and they kind of keep to themselves. It's, a, it's almost like a parallel community that shares the island, but they, they, there's not a whole lot of relationship between most Americans. Um, that so go to stay, people, right? The people that live there. Sir? They don't help the other people on the island. Like they kind of no, just don't. Not um, really. Not that I can. I mean, some do, obviously, right? They become part of the community, and I can give you specific names of people that did that. But the fact that I can give you specific names tells you that it's really not the majority of them. I just want to check if there's a qu any any questions on the WebEx. Hi, I have a question. I, it, it's or can you see me or somebody can see me? It's Betsy Marshall. Um, I'm an epidemiologist um, with the School of Public Health, NEOC. Yeah, Betsy, you, you, can, you can ask your question. Um, 
Okay, you mute. Somebody muted me. Okay, you there? Still there? Can you hear me? Yeah, we're here. Yeah. Okay, so I'm sorry. I also got called out in the middle. So you, I, I apologize if you already answered this question. But is there a, a general? First of all, how many? You know, you said there are now eight eight thousand or eight eighty four hundred people or something. But how many people were originally there when the Navy moved in? About twelve thousand. Okay, so a significant number. And is there any idea or plan to include former residents in the study, or is that something so that you have access possibly, to? If, if we are, as I said earlier, because of the fact that people leave the island when they get sick, we are going to have to figure out a way to follow them and sort of track them down outside of the island of Vegas. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't be people that left during the expropriation, right? It would be people that left because they got sick. Right, so the sort of the larger community losing population over time. And I assume there's some selection there over who's capable or who, yeah. willing and to And who move. wants to, right? Like this is their home and some people just don't want to leave no matter yeah. how sick they are. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then just one comment related to the issue of non-exposure, who's exposed and who's not. And it reminds me a lot of this long-running battle that went on, and I'm sure some people in the room were a part of it. I was just on the fringes um, for this long-term study of Love Canal, which was, you know, the one of the first Superfund sites. And, you know, it suffered from the same issue because it was in the middle of this community that was completely contaminated, right? Because it had every industry known to man there. And so they went through all these community-driven, partially community-driven um, debates over who, where to put, you know, where to find the data as a, who, who was the, the not quote non-exposed group? How do we compare these rates? And I'm not sure they ever re got the perfect thing, but it did, um, you know, that whole story is kind of the story of, of the of I'll, look, I'll read that up again, see if I can get any really great ideas. Okay, I'm gonna do like your question, so oh, we can, okay. because we are, there's so many questions. Um, she can have your email there. Anyone that has more questions can follow up. But just go ahead and, and ask the question. One last question. We can call oh, it's a bit lengthy, so it's it's really good. Cool. Yeah. Okay, so what political power like drove the ATSDR to like that is such a great I question. know that's what I was I, I um I don't know. I mean I can kind of guess, but I can't say with certainty what, what happened there. Um but you know it's a very big report and even in in ATSDR reports, they also publish the comments of the scientific reviewers. And when you read those comments, I mean, they were trashing the report. It was like saying, like, why are you even publishing this? Um, so, you know, they, they didn't come out on top in terms of credibility with that particular report. All right. We appreciate you again. Thank and you so much. Much.